Hi, my name is Isa Agape, and I am here with David Klavitz in Kuliga, Latvia, in his beautiful factory workspace for Unicorda. Um, and I wanted to sit down with you and kind of talk to you a little bit about where this, it, this all started for you and tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into this world of piano making. Thank you very much, first of all, for giving me the opportunity to talk about my story and tell my story. I am, um, let's say, firsthand a very analytically inclined person. From childhood onwards, or starting out in my childhood, I was very much interested in the, the why things are as they are, whatever things, all things of life. And when at the age of 16, I intentionally dropped out of school to build pianos, not to build pianos, but it was the result actually, I wanted to do something meaningful. Mm. So I dropped out of school, uh, the, I provoked to be kicked mm. by just don't attending anymore and it worked. My parents weren't so happy, but then my dad had the idea that I could be, become a musical instrument maker and he was playing the violin himself somewhat and he knew a violin builder, maker, mm -hmm. and uh, he, we visited the violin maker. I thought that may be a nice idea. I had heard about Stradivari and a million dollars or something, uh, yeah. well, why not? I could do the same, yeah. maybe. And uh, so we visited the violin maker and he dropped the term piano building. Why he had, no, he had no place, no space for me to educate me and uh, take me as an apprentice. But he said, why doesn't the young men consider piano making? They are, they are desperately looking for the next generation people, young people, uh, because it was a very unpopular profession back then. It's still unpopular, actually. And then, uh, of course, I was, not of course, but I was instantly fascinated about this idea. Oh, yeah, pianos, I mean, they're built somewhere. Yeah. We had an old piano at home. I don't know what, what, what figured in my head. I thought maybe pianos aren't built anymore or something. I had this idea. I needed the violin maker to drop this idea. Yeah. So, uh, and I loved the piano because my mother played piano very nice. And um, both parents were Latvians. They were like refugees, not directly, but they were, they were deported to Germany when Second World, before the end of Second World War. So they settled in Bonn, Germany. That's the place where I'm born and brought up and lived until 98, like until I was 38 years old. And uh, then I started traveling all kinds of places. But back to the origins. So I instantly liked the idea and, and I was applying for an apprenticeship with the Schimmel company in Braunschweig because they're the biggest manufacturer. I thought the best chance to get there and uh, they accepted my application. And so I started my apprenticeship at the Schimmel company in Braunschweig and, and finished uh, the basic education as a piano technician. And I'm emphasizing piano technician because piano building is not taught anywhere. There's no way to learn piano building, yeah. piano making. You yeah. learn how Schimmel pianos are made. Mm -hmm. You learn how to treat them. You learn how they're, uh, how to set up uh, the, the action, how to glue hammers and dampers. You learn all the processes as such, but you're not taught why things are exactly done like at this piano model and why couldn't they do, be done different? I was, uh, since, as I mentioned, that's why I mentioned, I am very analytically inclined, uh, so I was, uh, had a lot of questions. The more I learned about piano, the more questions I had. <laughs> why is this done this way? Couldn't it be done different? So, and all my instructors, they, they, um, they uh, knocked off any question with the argument, this is a waste of time, Mr. Clavins or David, this is a waste of time. The piano is finished. The piano has been invented 100 years ago, by about 100 years ago. Everybody knows the piano, loves the piano as it is now, and there is no space, there is no way, there is no reason for innovation of any sorts. Mm. I couldn't agree with this, um, but that was when I understood that the industry is totally in stagnation, yeah. which also is uh, easily to explain why it is so. But anyway, I found out that if I want to study piano making, I have to do it on my own. Mm. And so I started the journey of studying the piano 
first after my apprenticeship by two years of uh, very concentrated tuning work to understand the world of pianos. So, mm -hmm. And then I found that all the so-called old pianos, which are manufactured after 1900, uh, which are typically the modern piano, but mm -hmm. uh, maybe broken or worn out, um, that the piano shops were disregarding all these pianos. Uh, they didn't want that those complicated repaired works. Uh, they rather sold brand new pianos, made better profit by selling brand new pianos. So I saw my chance to establish a workshop and have then two, um, two objectives in mind. One is I would have a nice business because nobody cared about old pianos. And the second, I had a wide field of studying piano building, mm -hmm. piano making, because old pianos, they were made different. There's a, there was a lot of, let's say, experimenting up to the year about 1920 or so. Mm -hmm. And when, if you then took pianos from about the turn of the century, from the 19th to the 20th century, uh, but the, and th those pianos, uh, they were my typical candidates for restoration. If you take them apart, put them together, for example, restringing a piano gives you the opportunity to recalculate the string scale, the dimensions of strings. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, this is what I intensively studied from the onset. How uh, could we alter dimensions, string dimensions? Mm -hmm. Uh, in order to reach a different result in sound quality. What would be the the um, the big difference between una corda? And now these are the ones. These are some of your models. Correct? Yeah. Not all of them, obviously, because the grand, the big, big grand, can, could it fit in this room? Yes, of course. We built one here already. Okay. It's four meters fifty tall, and this space here is about five meters, a little bit. So ceiling height. What would be like, I mean, obviously the design set is what sets the una corda apart from the traditional piano, but there's also like uh, obviously big differences. Um, what would be, what would be some of those? Uh, it's easier to talk about the similarities because that's okay. only a few. Okay. <laughs> only, <laughs> only the keyboard and the action general principle yeah. of the action is the same like the right. other pianos but al already the action is altered so it's uh, from the setup and built uh, it's it's the regular action but for example since una corda pianos have only one string per note so we don't need the heavy wide hammer that the typical piano has that needs to hit three strings right. so we have much slimmer hammers uh, different wood for the hammer core which in our case is bamboo mm -hmm. because bamboo is very hard and very light at the same time mm -hmm. so it's very stiff and and light so which is very good for, for the uh, for action to work fa operate fast if you want virtuous playing or fast repetition in particular and some other modifications at the action mm -hmm. and then the, the entire uh, build of the piano is totally different by, by means of we have no we have no iron, uh, cast iron frames, but we have steel frames okay. as much as we do steel frame pianos. Uh, lately, we have developed pianos made of solid wood. Which is this one right Yeah, here. the out, outer frame is of solid wood and it will not get a box, so it will not be closed from, top, uh, from the front and the back behind the piano. Uh, like the, the modern or typical traditional pianos have a furniture around like that's actually making them a box, boxing in uh, the sound. Right. So we have an open soundboard so the sound can travel freely. And um, the newest, our newest uh, Unacorda is actually, uh, you could say, a symbiosis between um, the piano, the first pianos that were made 300 years ago about, mm -hmm. and the modern piano technology or modern material technology that allows for a construction like this being made of wood and being totally stable regarding keeping the tuning etc etc and this piano has a very uh, interesting sound as uh, you have heard already uh, it has a very colorful sound um, nevertheless the typical una corda character which is much a much more clean clear and transparent sound right. compared to any other piano so uh, all of these, uh, was, it was actually an evolution, you could say, on my part. Uh, the first, first uh, piano that I built was a concert grand piano, but a vertical concert grand. 
three meters seventy tall, two meters wide, and so you can imagine pretty big yes. thing. Yeah. And uh, that I built back in between eight, 1985 and 87. It was published, uh, uh, presented to the public in November 1987. It actually was my first big endeavor to uh, check out whether my thesis was correct. Uh, the thesis that the concert grand piano is too small mm. is acoustically disadvantaged that it's emanating the sound to the floor and to the ceiling. Mm. You wouldn't put a box on the back, typically on its back to, yeah, you would build towards the public. Yeah. And um, the fact that the design of the grand piano had been cut, so to say, cast in stone, it has to be done this way, there's no other way to do it. And I saw a lot of other ways to do it. I saw also design problems with all kinds of famous pianos. I won't my name names here, but <laughs> there are design problems with pianos. Yeah, we've had this conversation pianos. like two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and the last but not least, it's simply too small. The concert grand, as we know it, is too small for large concert halls. It has limited sound, power of sound capacity, so to say which in a uh, large part has, do, that has to do with the size of the piano. Mm. And I came to understand that uh, if you want to build bigger pianos, and if you want to build consequently by functional principles, and, and totally having to totally in mind that the most important is the sound of the piano, everything else must be subordinate. Mm. So I understood, I developed the concept that a real concert instrument piano should be a vertical piano, it should be much bigger and it must be integrated if it's too heavy to carry around. That's the other point, the piano industry had defined the pianos back when they were invented as uh, portable objects. And I was looking at the organ builders and said, why portable? The organs are installed in churches and concert halls and you could install a piano, why not, uh, if it's too big to carry. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Ventspils was the first Ventspils, a Latvian city nearby. Uh, they built a new concert hall and we had the privilege to install one of the four meter 50 concert grand pianos mm -hmm. in that concert hall. So that's where you can see and play it and hear it live. And uh, that was actually the, in 1987, I delivered proof of my thesis because pianists came visiting, checked the piano and confirmed my point. But there was no or very, very limited means of how, somehow promoting your own work because there was no internet in existence. There was nothing you could, not much you could do to somehow uh, make it known to the world what you're constructing the offering and, and the, which way there could be to go to develop the piano to the next stage. Right. And uh, so it showed actually that only virtually 25 years later, this piano, the first I built, was the main uh, reason why my work was became known and picked up steam. Mm. And that was because the company Native Instruments uh, published The Giant, which is based on the 3 meter 70 piano recording. Yeah, and that's actually the first time I've actually heard of Unicorda, was through Native Instruments, and I thought, this is cool. Um, and how many models do you, are you, are you producing now? Because I think it's like five? Yeah, essentially we have right now five models. That's the very smallest tuna corda made of wood with 52 keys. Then it's the two different versions of the 64 key tuna corda, one with steel frame, one wooden. Mm -hmm. Then the 88 key uh, tuna corda, which you see here, which yeah. we firstly built for native instruments to be sampled because they wanted to have 88 keys naturally. Yeah. And then uh, actually we have the concert on Accorda as the fifth and actually if you count, we have six, if we include the concert grand pianos, the vertical concert grand as I call it, that's mm -hmm. the number six. And uh, number five, which is the concert on Accorda, which we have at our concert hall, yeah. that's uh, a unique piano that's only built in one, one, one time. So it's uh, until now, I have on my website, I have I declared it as a limited series, but mm -hmm. I'm not very keen to build others, other pianos of this size because it has such a unique sound and such unique um, um, uh, yeah, features that uh, I would like pianists and artists of all kind to come and visit us 
if they want to utilize, use this sound for their recordings or their music. Which they can. Yeah, if I build <laughs> such pianos for other studios somewhere, then, piano, then artists go there. And so yeah. I would love them to come here. Come I'm here, yeah. welcoming artists anytime. We'll talk more about that in a bit, but um, were there any challenges that you faced making these pianos? There were huge challenges, starting from the onset. When I decided to build the 3 meter 70 piano and I found the materials, how it started was I was... Um, the 3 meter 70 piano. Yeah. It started uh, the way that I uh, was visiting the scrapyard and looking for very solid steel construction elements to be utilized for the frame of the piano. Yeah. So I had decided that it has to have a very solid outer frame instead of inner support frame like it's done with the traditional pianos. And I found four pieces of structured steel that were exactly 3 meters 70 mm -hmm. and they were, would fit by means of their dimensions, they exactly fit my imagination of the frame. So that's why it became 370. Had I found 3 meter 80 steel, it would be 380. Mm -hmm. Anyway, then I designed the acoustic system first, utilizing my knowledge, and my experience, and my in-depth insights into string scale calculation. Point, point out what the acoustic system is. The soundboard, the strings, the bridge, everything that's um, actually from the string to the soundboard, yeah, the entire uh, setup. And uh, that's, you could call that the acoustic system. And it is influenced, of course, by many other things, by the hardness of the hammer, by by but make of the piano, like you hear the difference between our wooden piano and the steel frame piano, for example. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of, so the, for example, the wooden frame in the wooden piano does, has a significant influence on the sound too. So you could name it, actually you could quote it as a part of the acoustic system, actually. But anyway, so once I had found those metals and started to put them vertically in my workshop and to try to start to figure a piano, yeah. then the first obstacle was that everybody was laughing about me. Was, what, what, come on, this, this is totally crazy. What, what, who in the world needs a 3 meter 70 tall monster piano? Nobody, yeah, monster. you can't use it, you can't do anything yeah. with it. I said, you can, you can put, integrate it in a space and you can, um, st it stays there forever. So what's yeah. the problem? But anyway, so the idea was so far off track that everybody was actually smiling when they saw my, my own people, my team, my yeah. workshop team, and my brother who was also working with me at that time. He was always saying, why don't you do something meaningful? I mean, come on, don't waste your time with this monster. It makes no sense. It took two and a half years to ponder and to build because there were all those obstacles that were technically related that such a piano had never been built before. So I had to develop the entire uh, conception, so to say, from the static uh, construction, how I would fix the soundboard. Uh, first of all, who does such huge soundboards? It mm. was a challenge to get such a huge soundboard, like three meters uh, in length and two meters wide. But there is a special company in Germany that provides soundboard wood where, until this day, we uh, our, our soundboards are supplied from this company in Bavaria, in Germany. And they did it. And so, yeah, it, it came to life uh, in 87 after two and a half years of pretty much quite a struggle, so to say. And But when once it was built and finished, I was very happy, as, as you can imagine. And a lot of other people were happy who met that piano at that time. And also people who later met the piano. And as I said, in particular, it showed in 2012, when The Giant was published, that this piano had a lot of, made a lot of sense. Mm. And not only to me, but to a lot of other people, as we in the meantime know. And then actually, from 2012, there was an organic development of all the other piano models. One, one led to the other, you could say. The most important event ever was that Niels Fram came visiting in yeah. 2014, January, yeah. to record his own music on the 3 meters 70 piano live. Yeah. Uh, because he's opposing all kinds of such virtual instruments. He wants to have the real thing. Yeah. And so he came recording his music. And uh, one of the outcomes was that uh, we discussed piano a lot because Niels is also digging deep into sound in general, but in particular the piano sound and how you could alter it, etc., etc. 
And uh, he was asking how, why those small pianos are so damn heavy, can't you make a lighter one? And I had, it, had the idea of doing a chord a long time ago also, <laughs> because many people were asking for softer sounding pianos, my clients, yeah. who, whom I made, uh, restored the old pianos for. Yeah. And so we discussed this idea and uh, Niels understood perfectly what it, where it goes and he commissioned me to build it. And so we had actually a nice cooperation by means I was, since I had this idea, conceptually it was clear in my mind how to build it, but not in detail. So when I started drafting it and set up the details, so I would send those drafts to Niels and ask for his opinion, how do you like this or looks of it or so. But it was clear from the onset that it would be a strictly functional design, nothing, no, no compromises on that part. So sound first, uh, sound second, sound third, and then everything else. <laughs> so, and so we had a nice cooperation in this regard that Niels um, had some suggestions, I made some changes, and, and so altogether it worked out fine. In uh, June 2014, Niels presented the piano to his fans in uh, Berlin. There were like 400, 500 people maybe and also the, some representatives from the Native Instruments Company, since they're sitting in Berlin. And uh, since they already knew that I do strange things, but maybe nice things, so yeah. they came uh, listening and Good. saw how happy the people were. It was really, everybody was really happy. It was fantastic atmosphere, a little bit like in the church, people were like, mm. eyes closed and mm. enjoying Neil's music. And uh, after the concert, Niels gave also, not concert actually, but a presentation of various pieces, but Niels also invited everybody in the public if somebody would like to check it out. So it was like a very friendly, oh, wow. nice uh, sit-in all together. And there were some people who played the piano who later ordered the Onacorda also. So that uh, started out from there. And uh, so I decided, ah, Native Instruments asked if they would, could, uh, sample the Unacorda too, and of course I understood how much, how good of an advertisement it would be, as I had experienced it already by the Giant uh, publishing. So uh, it came to the Unacorda virtual instrument, it, which was published in 2015. Mm. And for Native Instruments, we built the first 88-key Unacorda, and uh, Niels actually thought we should keep it at 64. He said, a real dual accord has 64 keys, come on, let it be. <laughs> but there was a number of clients who insisted, um, who loved the Unacorda sound, but insisted on 88 keys too. And so I thought, why should I deny them these wishes, their wishes? It's just more expensive to make, but uh, it's, we have made quite a number of 88 key in the meantime too. And so uh, one development led to the other artists who visited, who recorded, and other people heard about it. But still, it's actually the f in this stage, at this stage of development, uh, you could say that a lot of people in the professional music artists um, field, like in particular film music composers who work with natural, native instruments and other virtual instruments, they know about us because of those virtual instruments. Uh, and then, for example, Niels Frams, uh, fans, they of course know the Unacorda from the time when Niels was yeah. uh, traveling with the Unacorda at his 2015 uh, concert tour. And uh, then there is, of course, those videos out there where you can still see it uh, and hear, hear, hear it. But uh, there's a very limited scope of people who know our work, actually. Right. And, and I would be happy, of course, to expand that um, of those, that um, group and uh, number of people who's, who know. Of course, I would like to build some more on Accordas sure, uh, during sure. my... That's part of the reason why I wanted to sit down with you, is because I, uh, when I was first introduced to you, I came out here and saw all of these pianos, and I thought, wow. And then I started playing them and I thought, wow. <laughs> and I walked away uh, with the thought of, I, I think I just met the Steve Jobs of piano making. And I think I, I put it on my stories because I was buzzing after, because I was just so impressed by the functionality, the fact that you don't have to hit the keys so hard. Like you could just, in fact, you shouldn't. Yeah. And that they look cool. Like they look, like I can see this piano 
<laughs> in, my, in my studio <laughs> back at home in Austin. Thank you very much for this uh, huge compliment. And uh, in a way, you may be right um, uh, by the means that we are the only company who is really like systematically continuing to develop new pianos. Yeah. There is no other company worldwide. There are some peers of mine who try to innovate within the given shape and f right. of forms of piano, like, and they do extremely fine pianos like Wayne Stewart in Australia, for example, okay. really great, fantastic pianos, but they don't uh, deviate from the shape and the form of the traditional piano. Or highly significant also the work of Stephen Paolello in France. He's also a friend of mine who builds his own pianos, uh, grand pianos, for example, straight strung, which is pretty unpopular these mm -hmm. days because cross stringing seems to be the, the way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, we do straight stringing only, which means we have only one dimension of strings, so we don't cross them. Which I, which I think uh, creates a more smooth transition from the ba bass copper wound strings to the plain steel strings. And Stephen Paolello, by the way, has also uh, has, has invented, he's a pianist, mm -hmm. he has studied physics and uh, promoted physics and, and, a pian and, and a piano builder. So, and he came, uh, he understood that we need more mm -hmm. different string materials, mm -hmm. so he invented four new categories of, of uh, steel uh, for strings, uh, piano strings. So three categories softer than the traditional steel and one category harder. Mm -hmm. Which means you can re, uh, re-dimension, you can use different dimensions of, which is not possible if you have only one category of steel, you have to have certain, you're, you have to uh, design the length of strings in, within certain boundaries, pretty narrow boundaries. Mm -hmm. As soon as you have alter alternative materials, you can do totally different things and the piano sounds nice. So, for example, we utilize those steels at our Una Corda pianos. Mm. I would even say without Stephen Paolello, we couldn't build Una Corda pianos. We could build them, but they wouldn't sound that nice as they sound. Yeah. So, so for someone who's watching this, I'm, they're probably wondering, uh, how can I, could I come to the studio and maybe play piano? I mean, because obviously, like, yeah, they could go to go online and get uh, Native Instruments uh, library. Um, but what if they want to come here? I know that you've just opened up a recording uh, night sessions. Um, yeah. tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, at the moment, it is uh, the fact that our uh, concert hall, where the recordings would happen, has no soundproof, uh, is not soundproofed yet. Mm -hmm. So we offer as we, what we call the night recording session, night sessions, because then it's silent all around. It's uh, hardly any sound ever comes uh, is, is audible. And uh, on the long run, we will soundproof the space and also offer 24-7 recordings if artists would wish for. Because our space is very nice sounding, you have experienced it, it has very nice acoustics. Yeah. And you can l record a lot of different instruments there, yeah. not only piano, yeah. our pianos. Or other pianos, but our pianos are some of the nicest, as you know. Mm -hmm. I do know. <laughs> and you, you should not say, and, and I never use the term, they sound the best, because the best is a total, totally subjective, individual term. So, but nice, uh, I mean, nice Pretty is nice. Good. And, uh, nice, uh, I think they sound very nice. <laughs> and not, not only me, as we know, there's yeah, a lot I of mean, people I, who love I'm, that sound. Yeah. yeah. And so, we offer night sessions for recordings right now, and also uh, it's worth to mention that Kuldiga, the city we are, uh, which is quite a small, it's a rather a town, not a city, yeah. uh, about 10,000 uh, citizens in, this, in the town itself, and uh, you should take the surroundings, maybe like 20,000 people around. Yeah. But um, it's very picturesque, it's a, a very historically, uh, you, we could say, character, the character of the city is uh, the history of 200, 300 years. Mm -hmm. You have lots of old wooden houses that are really 300 years old or 200 years old. And, and uh, it's a very beautiful landscape all around, as you know. It's lots of forests and nature, green. And, uh, the river Venta cuts through the center of the city, actually. So it's uh, very attractive to visit us also by the means of 
the town itself, the people are very nice and open and all kinds, of, it's only positive, so it's no. only nice to yeah, come yeah. here. So, but the nicest thing of course is um, our pianos and uh, <laughs> and since not gonna lie there, guys. I, I welcome, <laughs> I, I'm highly interested in cooperating with um, yeah. artists from all, all over. over the globe, so yeah. to say. So everyone's really invited and welcome to come to get in touch and see. And we, we have very democratic pricing, as the Latvians have such term, democratic pricing. So uh, it's not the point that we want to make the big buck here by offering recordings, but we want to have um, uh, introduce our pianos to the yeah. world and um, make it possible also for artists who have not uh, or not uh, with the big labels or uh, covered by big money that they can record their beautiful music anyway, anyway so yeah. we so do what possible. we can to make it yeah, yeah. To, to 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 do the pricing as 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 humane as yeah. possible and if you're interested in obviously purchasing one of these you can absolutely do that absolutely welcome yeah, yeah. and uh, we build only on order and we okay. haven't we haven't had a chance except the concert on Accorda. It's the only piano I own myself, mm -hmm. or the company owns. But everything else is um, that you had a chance to see and play. That's clients' pianos. So yeah. and they happen to be here before when they finish. They typically go away pretty fast. <laughs> Sometimes um, they sit here for a while, like when the client asks uh, one client, for example, for this piano has a studio in Canada and he's re reconstructing the studio and uh, takes more time than he estimated so he would like us to send the piano when he's finished. So that's oh. why the piano sits here, why you could play it. That's why and I such things play. happen, <laughs> but we, um, right now for example we have uh, 11 orders, I think, yeah, pretty much exactly 11. Wow. And it takes, of course, time. It typically takes like six to eight months from order to delivery and sometimes unfortunately it can take quite a lot of longer time uh, because Materials. things happen, things happen. Like one thing that <laughs> happened was, was that um, the only supplier of keyboards in Germany uh, bankrupted in 21. And we had all of a sudden, we had no keyboards anymore for our pianos. Then it was a huge uh, painstaking uh, process to find finally that the only solution is we build our own keyboards, we start keyboard manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And the keyboard is a very tricky thing to manufacture. It's very tricky, I will not go into detail, but it's high precision first of all, with wood, soft wood and, and, and materials that typically are not very favorable for high wow. precision handcrafting. But it needs the, the utmost precision in in um, manufacturing process, yeah. And right now, no, but now in the meantime we've set up, I have two people employed actually that are uh, f mainly focused on keyboard making. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Five people are together in the team right now. Which is, which they're next door? Yes. yes. And so, <laughs> they're probably like, uh, they when, when, presently when keep are we quiet gonna, so <laughs> that we can talk, yeah. So that they can work. One more question before we go. Um, what do you hope people will experience or feel when they play or listen to your pianos? I hope very much that, uh, and I've seen it also, I've experienced it, that people are inspired to uh, play and compose um, a very positive music. I would, as, but what I call positive is music that influences your soul, your heart, that makes you more peaceful, your mind uh, brings your mind to rest somewhat in this hectic and aggressive world. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we need altogether is more harmony mm. worldwide, as we know. It's, mm. The world is pretty much in a disarray. And my hope is that the Unacorda sound, as such, and the fantastic artists to utilize it, bring more peace to the planet. Yeah. Well, more positive feelings, positive vibes in the best meaning of the term. Well, thank you so much uh, for sitting down with me this afternoon. And thank you very much, Isa. And, uh, I really appreciate. Oh yeah, I just I was just so like you said, I was so inspired um, leaving here and just thinking more people need to know about these pianos. <laughs> I couldn't keep it to myself. I like Marco, a bunch of my friends, and they were like, "You should sit down with him and actually interview him." And so I was like, "That is a good idea. I should do that." And so. I'm just grateful that you um, were willing you to much. do that. And, Thank you. And uh, yeah, we'll just... Uh, Looking forward. Yep. End it here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.
Those are for the making. Yeah, these are all ordered pianos for clients. These are yeah, five, the next five, 64 key pianos in wood. And, and that goes? Yeah, those steel are steel frames for the steel next frames. steel frame pianos, yeah. Awesome. And then there's a lot of small tech materials, so kind of storage here. Yeah. yeah. I know that you, you shouldn't hit the key hard. You should hit it softly. Correct. Yeah, I mean, the character of the piano itself is rather soft and um, like a sound that is uh, more, we would say, soothing. And uh, if you hit the key hard, then you get more inharmonicity. Yeah. By the way, inharmonicity is a totally misunderstood term in the piano theory, building, piano building theory teachings. Mm. Inharmonicity is a whole subject on its own. So if you hit it pretty soft, you hear quite nice tone. If you hit it, I mean, it's not pleasant. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's actually really uh, more uh, for soft sounding music, for like fine structured music. Or um, in particular, the 64 key, this one, if you... This is my, my, the style of my own improvisations, but, sure. but you hear the character of it. Yeah. Now, if you do something again like whatever, you can do it, but it's, in my view, not that nice like those, sure. not those more contemplative uh, tones. And the difference in sound between this, this is more steel, right? And this is completely wood. Yeah, and this is the, the wood uh, structure which has only a steel uh, hitch pin panel, it's called, where the strings are fixed. That needs to be steel because it needs to be anchored very solidly so that the piano keeps the tuning. And yeah, it has an interesting... The last time I was here, you had put some sort of uh, fabric, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, fabric. Is that, is that what um, softens the strings? Yeah, that's like this, for example. This is a bar that you simply attack, uh, attach to the piano. And then you have a very soft sound, like, for example. So it's almost felt, would, would yeah. you say? Felt. It's like a one millimeter felt. Nice. And then you can, of course, also have just different materials, like, for example, <clears throat> this is a cloth, like a, like a yeah, certain type of cloth. With a, mm -hmm. um, you could also experiment a lot with different materials, like with um, cotton or silk or whatever. And that alters the sound, but that not necessarily dampens it that yeah, much. Yeah. Like. And then the, I want to go to the, the actual concert. the concert hall. Yeah. You just had a concert here last yes. weekend. You said that this is the finest concert piano. Finest sounding, but finest by means of fine, nice, and also by means of delicate, okay. delicate sound. And the purpose of the size of this piano is the quality of the bass, because there's a, somewhat a compromise, you could say, with the small one accordas mm -hmm. in the lowest bass part because they, of the size of the soundboard and because the strings come pretty close to the... the bridge gets pretty close to the soundboard rim. Mm -hmm. Now here, about a half, of, half meter width and height is only for the lowest bass note that it's far away from the soundboard rim, so it can sound saturated, beautiful, round, like it should. And this piano I built specially to uh, honor Bach, because I realized that Bach music, Bach's music, and mm. by that means all Baroque music, uh, or most of it sounds more authentic and simply more convincing and more beautiful on this yeah. piano. Yeah. And uh, so to honor Bach, I built this special quality by means of height, size, and the quality of the bass, and not for loudness again. These bass notes, they sound the nicest if you touch them soft.
So, and uh, yeah, as I said, this is uh, this piano has been built only once. And this is it, and it also has a self-playing system, QRS self-playing system. So, you, for creative composers, for example, you can create uh, compose loops that piano plays itself, and you play forehand piano with yourself, for example, or you can play distant concerts, like remote concerts. Yeah. The pianist can sit in Tokyo or New York yeah. and send MIDI signals through the internet and this piano plays. All kinds of such All kinds of possibilities. Cool. You know. Like this, for example. On a regular piano, this would sound pretty nasty. Mm. Here, why not? But here it sounds so pretty. <laughs> Could do even a whole concert like this. And so on. So it's a lot of fun and with this so-called contemporary classic. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, amazing, amazing, so it is. Amazing. Let's go there, see what happens.